the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we heard this morning the reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the account of Jesus walking on the water while the disciples were fearful in the boat. Without knowing it at that time, when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water, they were witnessing for the very first time in their lives a manifestation of a true human being, an example of true humanity. For when God created Adam, he made him Lord of the earthly creation. As the newly created Lord of creation, Adam had no fear of any of God's creatures and they had no fear of him. He lived in full communion with the living God and in harmony with all of God's creation. And in a matter of speaking, he lived above creation. He was over creation. But all of that was lost in Adam's fall into sin and disobedience. His disobedience called, caused him to fall, just as Lucifer's arrogant defiance of God caused him to fall. And so Adam, to whom the creation was subject, became himself subject to the creation. He now found himself walking in fear of the creatures that he had once ruled over. He now found himself suffering the assaults of nature, <clears throat> whether it was wind or sun or fearful deluge of water. He suffered the ravages of time. But Jesus manifested true humanity once again and so was neither fearful of nor stopped by the winds, the waves of the storm, or anything that creation could throw against him. This restoration of the original state of Adam can often be seen in the lives of the saints. <clears throat> Their hearts have been purified and so have become fit vessels for the grace of the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the peace of God. They exude peace throughout and everything in their presence becomes at peace as well, often without knowing it. Most of us know very well the story of Saint Seraphim of Sarov <clears throat> and the wild bear who used to visit his hut became like a tame animal, a pet, as long as he was with Seraphim. If anyone else came around, he was once again a wild bear and roared and threatened to attack them unless Seraphim called him off. Saint Sergius of Radonej also had a bear who would visit his hut and Sergius would feed him every day whatever bread that he happened to have. Sometimes there wasn't enough bread for both of them, and so he would always give the bread to the bear and go without for the rest of the day himself. And his disciples chided him for that. You shouldn't give it to the bear. There's not enough for both of you, you should eat. And he said, no, it's better that the bear have the bread because he doesn't know anything about fasting. <laughs> Saint Paisios of Mount Athos, who recently died in 1994, <clears throat> was well known for his friendship with the animals and especially with deadly snakes. He once was seen to pick up a huge deadly snake in his compound and he walked slowly and gently set it on the other side of the fence and then said, no, 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 stay there until the others leave because if they see you, they'll try to hurt you. Come after they leave, you can come back. He was at peace with God's creation. He was filled with the peace of God and so all of creation was at peace with him as well. Some of you may recall me telling you about the monk Stephanos on Mount Athos, whom I met, I think it was in 1996. We met at Grigorio Monastery on the stairway as I was going back to a cell and he was leaving his going to the services, but the services were over and so we spoke for a few minutes. And I remember his name because at the time I was the priest of St. Stephen Orthodox Church, and I shared that with him, and we talked about that for a few minutes. I didn't see him again. He was an old man in a tattered riasa. In fact, he was visiting their clinic. I didn't see him again until the morning that I left the monastery, and it was a stormy day, and back in those days, the boats were small that took you to and from Athos, and sometimes you weren't sure whether you're going to get off Athos or not or whether you're going to be able to come to Athos because the, the, the boats were so small they could easily be capsized. And there was a big storm 
And I remember the waves crashing over the boat, the sides of the boat, and they would strike us like icicles, like knives, and the wind was roaring. I was dressed for it, <clears throat> but I was still freezing. I had my clothes on, I had my cassock on after that, I had a winter sweater on, I had a winter jacket on, I had a scarf, I had my gloves, and I was shivering. And I looked at the back of the boat, and there was Father Stephanos, just looking up radiantly. And it seemed to me that his face even shone. And gradually I began to come aware of the fact that he wasn't even bothered by the elements. They didn't seem to touch him. And he wasn't wearing anything other than the old tattered riasa that I had first seen him in. I was amazed. I came back <clears throat> a year later to Grigorio and I asked the fathers about Father Stephanos. He had fallen asleep in the Lord. He died in the meantime. And they said that they had gone to his, his hut, his little skeet, when he didn't show up at the monasteries begging for bread as often as he used to. They went looking for him. And they found him and they were amazed. There he lay in the hut, but what a hut it was. There was really no roof. It was open to the elements year round. And he lived there just in that tattered riasa year round, whether it was snowing, whether it was raining, whether the sun was beating down. He was untouched by the elements. He was at peace with God's creation and God's creation was at peace with him. While well, returning to Matthew's gospel, in the middle of the night, the disciples, who've never seen a true man, <clears throat> see a man walking on the water untouched by the storm, and because they don't know true humanity, they can only think that it's a ghost. It's the only thing it could be. But the Lord calls out to them, it is I, don't be afraid. And they're astonished and have no idea how it can be. And yet Peter shows amazing faith, and he calls out to him, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. <clears throat> and the Lord said, come. This is really impressive. Peter had never seen anything like this before, and yet already he had such faith in the Lord that if the Lord called him, he would go. And note that he didn't rush out on his own. He didn't just charge out once he saw the Lord. He said, Lord, you call me and I'll come. And in that way, he avoided the sin of presumption. Instead, he acted in obedience with the blessing of his spiritual father. It's a lesson for all of us. And so long as he kept his attention on the Lord, he walked on the water. An amazing sight for the rest of the disciples to behold as well. But just for a moment, he began to notice what was going on around him. And when he took his eyes off the Lord, just for that moment, he saw and he heard how powerful the wind was. He felt the waves crashing against him. He instantly became afraid and began to sink. He began to sink into a pit of fear and confusion and fearing for his very life, he called out, Lord, save me. And the Lord saved him. That brief story is so instructive for us. <clears throat> it's full of wisdom and will help us in our daily lives as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death that is this life if only we will listen to it and apply the lessons of it. That's no doubt why Matthew included it in his gospel. I've already pointed out the first lesson. Act in obedience to the word of the Lord and not in presumption of your own desires. You should always make sure that the decisions of your life are in accordance with God's will and have the blessing of your spiritual father and are not simply in accordance with your own desires, something that you want to do. There's always danger in presumption, but there's always safety in obedience with a blessing. Another obvious lesson is that we have to be vigilant to keep our eyes, our attention on the Lord. As soon as we remove our eyes from the Lord, we fall into trouble. St. Ignati Priyanchaninov wrote, the followers of God are given various sorrows during which the providence of God seems to hide from them and the influence of the world seems impossibly strong. That captures in a nutshell what was happening to St. Peter. He suddenly found himself in great sorrow and fear, and the providence of God was nowhere to be seen. He was overwhelmed by the influence of the wind of the world, which seemed to him impossibly strong. St. Ignati goes on to write, it's necessary 
to teach them living faith in God. That is, God allows these difficulties to happen, these sorrows, because it's necessary to teach them living faith in God, which only increases and becomes stronger with such experience. This experience uncovers lack of faith, which is natural to fall in nature. It exposes rejection and renunciation of God, because as soon as vigilance ceases, even for a moment, the heart begins blindly to seek to put trust in itself, in the world, in created matter, and to stop trusting in God. I imagine most of us can relate to that comment. We have times of blessing from the Lord and everything seems to be going so well. He's constantly in our heart. We pray, we rejoice in the Lord. And then suddenly everything seems to fall apart. No longer looking at Jesus, we now only see the terrible circumstances that surround us and we're overwhelmed and soon fall into despair. St. Ignati says that God has not departed He's not abandoned us. He's, not allowed, he's only allowed this in order to help us grow closer to the living God, which seems so paradoxical. Because first, this trial shows us that we lack faith. As soon as we lose the sense and the feeling of God's grace, we think we're lost and the world's circumstances lead us down to our ruin and to our death. All we can think of is how bad things are and fear that they'll never be any different, how hopeless it all seems. But God hasn't disappeared. He's not dead. He simply has revealed to us how little faith we have, how unstable we are, because one moment we're praising him and the next we reject him by losing sight of him because the terrible circumstances seem to overwhelm us and the circumstances seem bigger than God to us, more important than God, and that's our faithlessness revealed. And God reveals it not to shame us, not to make us feel bad. St. Ignati says, such lack of faith is common to fallen human nature. It's true of all of us. God reveals it to us so that we realize how weak in faith we are, which prevents us from becoming lost in satanic pride. Just think if Peter had successfully walked on the water both to Jesus and then back. Can you imagine the pride that the rest of the disciples would have had to deal with? For the rest of the journey it wouldn't have been healthy for Peter and so God allowed providentially the circumstances to overwhelm him to humble him God is opposed to the proud the scripture says but gives grace to the humble we have only to humble ourselves in repentance and call out to God Lord save and he will save us so vigilance is called for wakefulness of soul is called for and how can we be vigilant at all times? How can we be spiritually wakeful? Well, first of all, Holy Communion is given to us for the wakefulness of our soul. Immediately after the consecration of the gifts, the chalice and the pat and the bread and the wine, the priest prays that they may be to those who partake for the vigilance of soul, the wakefulness of soul, the watchfulness of soul, how can we be vigilant at all times? First of all, by being regularly prepared to receive Holy Communion. It takes vigilance to prepare to receive Communion. And Communion brings grace to us if received properly and appropriately and brings the grace of watchfulness to us. And secondly, the Apostle Paul showed us the way in saying that we should pray at all times. Pray without ceasing. But how do we do that? We've been given a simple prayer, the Jesus prayer. In one form or another, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Or at times simply, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Or at times simply, Lord, save. And this prayer, after a time, begins to pray itself in our hearts. If we're faithful to continue it persevere with it. Sadly, most of us give up very quickly and think, well, it just doesn't work for me. It works for others. Finally, there's another important lesson in the passage. St. Tertullian wrote that the little ship in this gospel passage of scripture presents a picture of the church. 
The church is disquieted and troubled in the sea of life in this world by the waves, that is by persecutions and temptations and hard circumstances of life. In this life, we're constantly shaken by circumstances, sometimes terrible circumstances. And in addition to the need to keep our eyes focused upon the Lord rather than the world, we also need to simply stay in the boat. And that's the great lesson. Peter can be commended for his faith, but one can also see the dangers of getting out onto the water. When we think of the boat as the church, then certainly to make it safely from one side of the, of the lake, as it were, to the other side, that is from life to death in the shores of the heavenly kingdom, then the ship that God has provided for us and for our salvation is the vessel that we must remain in. Jesus himself is called the captain of our salvation, our helmsman. He's the one who safely steers the ship, the church. And it sails by the wind of the Holy Spirit. And on board the ship, there we are. Within the church, we find all of the provisions that are necessary, not simply for our survival, but for our thriving in Christ. Here are the holy mysteries, the medicines of our salvation, the sacraments, the healing therapies of our spiritual growth. To remain in the boat, to remain in the church, means to live as fully as possible within the liturgical and sacramental life of the church. To taste regularly the mysteries and medicines of our salvation. Here alone, we are free from the buffeting of the world and the devil. Here we can find healing for our souls and our bodies. Here we can be instructed in the way in which we should go and how we should live. I've always reminded people that staying in the boat is the only safe way of passage through this life, but it doesn't mean freedom from the storms. Storms are guaranteed. The scriptures are very clear and very honest about that. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of heaven, the apostle said. The boat is tossed to and fro in this life, but it's never capsized. The waves crash over it and people become soaked and ill, but remaining in the boat, they never drown. They never perish. Some people in the boat are expert sailors. They can climb to the highest heights. I'm afraid of heights, but the saints aren't. Others have no stomach for sailing and they either find themselves throwing everything up over the rails of the ship or the lying on the bottom of the ship sick to their stomachs for the rest of the voyage. But both saints and sick ones arrive safely on the shores of the heavenly kingdom if they remain in the boat. Take that truth home with you. Think about that. Apply it as we travel from one shore to the next to the glory of God the Father. Amen.